Right, I now want to make some particular remarks. One is that if you try to do perturbation theory using this, so that is how this nonlinearity becomes important in the diagrammatics. The perturbation theory shows that the coupling G is uh, asymptotically free as it is called, G grows weaker at So, firstly from the f mu nu f mu nu terms, such as uh, d mu a mu times f right and so and there is a g in front of them somewhere we did not put a G here, I am completely confused about G because I have never really dealt with this theory in any detail. Okay, I know the general properties. So, there is G somewhere there in the nonlinear terms that has to do with proper definitions of things. Yes, so you remember we, we did d mu d nu and we got i g for the first terms and that got g square. So, there is a g multiplying this. So, I will tell you very frankly several books will not display a g when they just want to discuss the geometry and the underlying structure. If you want to do perturbation theory then you have to restore g here. So, if you do this then there will be a g here and a g square here. So, if you want to do perturbation theory, then you have to introduce this g because <coughs> what even the so called free field theory or the simplest possible theory you can possibly write for the field strengths or for these group algebra valued potentials a mu, the kinetic terms come packaged with the interaction terms you cannot so by kinetic term we mean things that are just square of derivative right t x dot square so but along with d mu a a mu d, d nu a mu will you will automatically also get stuck with 
stuff like this, which is all nonlinear in A. The only possible gauge invariant Lagrangian you can write is packaged with interactions, but fully determined. This is not left to imagination. It has to be exactly G and it has to be exactly G squared. So, you do not have one, der one derivative and two underivative with some one coefficient and four A's with some other coefficient. This coefficient is exactly G square and the, and the whatever the values that F A B C give you. So, it is a big package deal and a little uh, unusual from our conventional approach of taking free Lagrangians and adding interactions to them. It is a package deal in which interactions, if you, so if you want to think of the A mu as the elementary uh, potentials which you quantize by saying A and pi A commutator equal to I H cross then those quanta are automatically forced to be interacting. You do not have a theory of free quanta, free non-abelian quanta. So, there is no such thing as dot dot dot. However, if you start, if you assume applicability of perturbation theory and treat these as diagrams, okay. So, we can treat this as a diagram with three gluons, where one of them because there is a derivative, there is a P mu on it. and G will be the strength, okay. So, some you have to put some A and mu, sorry. And the F A B C. And then there is a 4 gluon diagram with that G square. A mu, yeah, that has to be mu. So, P mu with an A mu and then in 2, so 1 A nu, yeah sorry, so this is A nu, okay. correct, okay. So, nu A nu C and then mu B that ties to that P mu, etcetera, okay. Now, if you use these as elements of perturbation theory, then you find that the coupling G gets renormalized in a way that it grows weaker at higher momenta, at uh, higher, scat higher momenta of scattering amplitude. So, this is the second biggest discovery of
and asymptotically goes to 0. Asymptotically in momenta goes to 0. So, the first biggest discovery is to discover that gauge symmetry describes all the interactions, but the second biggest discovery is that the couplings actually go to 0 asymptotically. So, this led to coining the very mysterious term asymptotic freedom. Asymptotically the gauge field theory is a free field theory. So, the dot 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 meant that no such thing is the little too strong. If you can live asymptotically at infinite momentum then you have a free field theory, but then you have to live asymptotically, you cannot live here. And, uh, but there is another clever thing that was discovered by Toft. The, so, wait in, in parts. So, we draw this by saying that uh, alpha strong, you know, which is equal to g square over 4 pi for S u, but it is S u 3, not S u 2. It runs like this. So, it is, so put 1 over here and it is something small and of course, going to 0 in in the, so square in S you know, S is the S parameter of scattering. is a function of s is it goes to 0, but then you have to you can only put dotted lines here, because here perturbation theory begins to fail. If it grows towards 1, then the perturbation theory fails. So, we do not really know what happens here, okay, what once it approaches 1, we do not know whether it becomes 1. In fact, it becomes meaningless, because now you cannot separate you. So, the main conceptual problem here is not that it is a, just that it is a strongly coupled theory. It is not as if you had the same excitations a mu, which are now fighting with each other more strongly it is that you do not even know what the degrees of freedom are. If this theory is asymptotically free, then you can see a free quantum streaming out and you can say oh this pin 1 particle or helicity 1 particle is what in the interaction region interacts, but when it is here you cannot even see what the ingredient of the theory is. <coughs> so, really whether one can then separately quantize the A's and then think of interaction among them all that fails. You remember in the beginning of the semester we went through this uh, Fock Dirac quantization, where we said you can identify whether there are bosons or fermions and then if there are <coughs> bosons the states get can be labeled simply by the number of bosons. All that logic was applicable to the free theory or very weakly interacting theory, so that the interactions were local, but by and large the system was non interacting. That entire picture fails completely and we do not actually know how to well, so quantizing the system here is a 
um, dicey affair. Okay. Some light on this was thrown by Ethoft's clever observation that if you use large n, so the in the S, you take S u n group, so the n of S u n you make it large. <coughs> then it turns out that uh, that n enters somewhere here. I should have written it in that form. So the coupling itself becomes uh, so in the diagrams all any loop of uh, with any graph of n loops has a 1 over n in front of it. Therefore, in the limit of large n all the loops become subdominant and only tree diagrams survive. Okay. So, So, for large n, only the, the tree, tree diagrams are dominant. Which is the free field theory? Well, not exactly free, but because the tree diagrams are still there, but for in quantum field theory tree is supposed to be the free part of it, There's, people think of it as essentially the classical thing. There is no real quantum mechanics, it is just that things can break up and combine, but there are no, uh, in a tree diagram there is no internal, internal momentum to be integrated over, right? because the energy momentum conservation fixes all the momenta in the, so all you have is a matrix element. So, tree diagram essentially is free fields, although things can break up and recombine, but there are no quantum corrections. So, <coughs> SUN theory is for large n you get free fields. In fact, uh, I think only the planar diagram survive or something like this. So, so this was a, a interesting simplification. The reason I am telling you this is that although we have a differential equation you know from that f mu nu f mu nu Lagrangian we can write equations of motion which I did not write I will come back to it. Okay. So, we can write the equations of motion for f, but it is meaningless to solve them because there is nothing called a classical Yang Mills field it is meaningless, there is no state of the system. So, for photons we, we have plenty of classical looking states, in fact they are fully quantum, but we can think of free streaming photons, we can count individual photons, we have you know children attach meters and measure potentials. You cannot do any such thing to uh, gauge fields, they actually do not have a classical existence at all. Anybody who is trying to solve a differential equation, find an exact solution of it and try to think that he has actually found something physical is mistaken, because it has no such interpretation. There is no such thing, so you might try to say some state psi, right, in which I find this as an expectation value. There are no such states available. 
in which you can take expectation value of your field and then say oh this is my classical value. In other words we cannot write any effective potential which is you know whatever. There is no such thing okay, Z of A classical. It has no meaning in no way that you can derive such an effective potential out of the full path integral the functional of the theory. However, classical solutions do play a very interesting role and so I will come back to it later. So, first thing is there is no such thing as free non-abelian gauge fields. And the second thing is that there is in fact no classical gauge field. Because the only gauge invariant Lagrangian you can write for it comes packaged with interactions and if you put in the interactions then it is strongly coupled and there is nothing like that is classical. You can say oh, but I am going to observe it at only very high momenta. Well good luck because you have to first get one to give it to give it high momentum, but you can never get one out. So, in reality the we only find them. So, this asymptotically asymptotic freedom implies confinement. which is a funny word because then you at least presume that you know what is confined, but you do not know what is really confined. Okay. Well, they say quarks and gluons. Neither quarks nor gluons can be pulled out indefinitely, because if you do it then you are going to infrared limit. If the point is to separate two things out and to see them separately you will have to go to large distances, but large distances usually mean low wavelengths which means the infrared this is the para S parameter. So, at large collision energies you can think of it as weak, but when you are trying to pull it apart you are in this region and then you can never really pull it apart. Okay. So, this required a proof by uh, lattice gauge theory. So, the only proof we know What Wilson did was to introduce, uh, so the lattice is primarily a regulator, you introduce some separation you uh, to not to avoid the in, uh, infra the ultraviolet parts. So, you have integrated ultraviolet parts you just have points in space. And what he proved was that any two quarks. the the force between them grows as the area bounded by the uh, flux lines that connect connect them okay so uh, right so the statement is that the area of this energy of this grows linearly as the area. So, if you try to take, take contributions of all the possible loops then you get a infinite answer. 
so this indicative proof that then you have to you can think of some quarks sitting on this loop so i have already put the quarks but he just proves it for uh, gluons at, between the gauge fields any gauge loop ga gauge loop uh, its energy grows as the linearly as the area but nobody has the full picture in the same language so the problem with lattice is a very peculiar one uh, so once lattice gauge theory was invented people actually started doing numerical calculations because now you take the functional integral and instead of doing the da you simply start doing product over so here you remember you had to do product over all space time points but now you can do it over the lattice points xi right you can do this so people put it on a numerical on a lattice and then try to calculate they get various answers but eventually they have to extrapolate them to lattice spacing going to zero to recover the continuum what happens then is a very interesting thing because lattice is the real lattices in real life they themselves show phase transitions as you change the lattice spacing depending on what interaction you have put between the nearby in, uh, what uh, between the members of the lattice there are phase transitions so you do not know whether you are actually approaching a lattice phase transition or you have reached the continuum limit okay so conceptually there are some issues with lattice gauge theory now so it is an unproven mathematical fact but it is a well established empirical fact that the scattering the effective coupling grows weaker at high so this now in lhc of course which is such a high energy they are mostly weakly coupled coupled quarks and things that they did in early days can now be applied very freely by extrapolation the energy dependent running is exactly as expected and so on so there is a lot of confirmation of qcd in this regime we know that it's exactly like this we also have never pulled out any free quark or gluon so the confinement hypothesis looks correct whether it mathematically follows from this particular yang mill symmetry is not uh, proved but it would be too surprising if there was something uglier that gave the same answer because this is very elegant and has all the ingredients needed to explain it uh, the last thing i can do is we get to this uh, topological part and the way to motivate it is that well so before we go on just the equations of motion are that uh, no surprise in guessing renu is constructed out of the quark so it is psi bar gamma mu tau a right so it is so this is all like this no so that is what the currents are and the other associated equation is the faraday's law and d and uh, dive b equal to 0 law is simply written by mu nu rho and then we put this on them so this means cyclic permutations this notation is for mu nu putting this box means mu nu rho plus nu rho mu plus etc so this is exactly for the as in electromagnetism so structurally it looks very similar but as i told you there are uh, uh, subtleties because there will be a mu a mu terms here in the f there will be small f a b c a, a mu b a mu c 
and so there is no point trying to quote solve this equation. But we will see some clever equation, clever solutions that do exist. One other point is that the Lagrangian also contains another candidate term. So recall in Maxwell case, we had But we also have E dot B equal to epsilon mu nu rho sigma F mu nu F rho sigma is also a Lorentz invariant. This we do not put in the Lagrangian by arguing that uh, this, the, this is not parity invariant. If you as you remember in the poor man's language E is a true vector and B is a pseudo vector. So if you do a space inversion this term will change sign. Okay, so, you do not want to include such terms in the Lagrangian. In the more sophisticated language here, you, what you do know is that the epsilon tensor is invariant under the flip of all the four f mu nu, it is the, it's the volume element of that uh, number of space time dimensions. The volume element does not change sign. So, it will not change sign whereas the other things will change sign together. So, it is the same reason that, so it is a pseudo scalar, it is not a genuine scalar. It is a scalar, but it is pseudo scalar. Therefore, there is a determinant that comes in, uh, in the flipping. So, so, we may not want to include such a term. Also in the abelian case, it turns out to be a total derivative. So, you can throw away the term by saying well it is something to do with things at infinity. But in the non abelian case that term on the infinity also matters. Okay. So, it turns out that And actually, P 
you can choose gauge field configurations that are pure gauge, but they are laid out in space time in such a way that they cannot be contracted to 0, okay, because you have a u as a function of x. So, even though the uh, function if, even if also we will see next time we have space R 3 okay, or we could have R 4 as well space time. From this we are mapping into this S u 2 space. right you make some map from here to there. Now this is a compact <coughs> as we had argued last time it is like a compact ball which is an S3. If you take this R3 and treat all of its boundary S2 as one point the boundary is S2 right. So, if you treat S2 as one point then this R 3 also becomes a 3 sphere for the same argument we had here. Remember you start from the origin and you come out the outermost shell you identify with one point because it is uh, e raised to 2 pi i right. So, it is just equal to my by 2. Uh, so, it is just minus 1. So, outermost surface is equal to minus identity of S u 2. For the same reason if you identify the outermost in other words you map the outermost S u 2 exactly into this minus 1 then structurally this has become topologically same as this. And then the number of ways you can map an S 3 into an S 3 is classified by integers. If you start mapping you reach halfway point here you map cover the whole of this space. So, so suppose some sphere here you map into minus 1 and then continue going out such that you begin to go inward. So, that when you reach out for at infinity you have mapped back to 1. So, you start with 1 go there and map back there that map is distinct from when you start from here and end only here the entire thing maps here. And then you can do play this game many times you can reach minus 1 then reach 1 then minus 1 then 1 and so on. So, you can map this into this in uh, many number of ways which are essentially indexed by integers with a positive and negative winding number. So, because of that fact even if you give me a pure u. So, suppose I construct a gauge field a mu which is simply equal to minus i uh, what had we written d mu u d u, u dagger or whatever right. This is a pure gauge field because the u a u part is 0 you, you did not start with any gauge field to begin with. Suppose you construct a gauge field that is entirely of this form. So, it is a gauge transform of nothing, but this u could be a non trivial map. In that case you are stuck with a non trivial mu which although it is pure gauge it has no physical uh, field strengths it is not identical to it is not the same as the vacuum you started with earlier. So, this kind of things arise in gauge fields which we will do next time. <coughs>